Chapter 7 Fate Fate awoke to find himself sandwiched between crisp white sheets resting on a perfect mattress. He opened his eyes, turned to look at the glow flowing through the white curtains, and smiled. He loved hotels. This particular two-star hotel was at the edge of the downtown district. It was a common, past-its-prime, single-story string of rooms, arranged in a U-shape around a small parking lot. In short, it was not posh by anyone's standards. Lafayette Cordonnier, or fate to his friends, loved all hotels and, due to his peculiar circumstances, didn't need to be choosy. For most people, getting the nicest or worst room in a hotel was a matter of chance. But for fate, the nights were always quiet. The sheets were always crisp. The mattress was always just the right amount of firm. The shower was always hot, and the heater always worked perfectly. Fate threw back the covers and let the chilly air wake him. He made his way to the bathroom, efficiently performed his morning ablutions, careful to turn one way and then the other in perfect symmetry. This took no conscious effort on his part. By now, it was pure habit. Once showered, shaved and dressed, he opened the outside door and greeted the day properly with a deep breath, having no idea what mysteries the day would hold. Fate was wearing his usual white suit and black bow tie. The extra-long jacket hadn't been fashionable since the late 1800s. His Van Dyke-style curly moustache and pointy triangle beard hadn't been seen for even longer. These odd features always drew unwanted attention, but Fate found that changing his appearance every ten years to assimilate was just too exhausting. He had arrived in town the night before with no idea why he was there, why the coins had brought him to this place. He didn't know, and he didn't care beyond a mild curiosity. Fate was one of the rarest of human beings. He was a man without a care in the world. Fate looked left and then right, pulled a pair of tarnished coins from his pocket and tossed them in the air. The coins each had a shiny silver bezel and chain. The chains were linked together by a swivel that allowed them the freedom to spin independently. As soon as they left his hand, the coins twisted and spun in each other's orbits. With a practiced hand, fate snatched one at random while it was high in the air and brought it down for examination. Its twin dangled from its silver tether as he opened his hand to reveal the message. The red letters laid down in fine calligraphy on the face of the coin said, Turn right. Fate thrust his hand out to make the partner coin swing forward and quickly snapped his hand back. The other coin dropped into his palm with a clink. Fate didn't bother looking to see if it said, Go straight or stop. He simply turned to his right and strolled down the street. Before he reached the next crossroad, he tossed the coins again with the same result. Fate paused to peek around the corner. Years of experience had taught him to be cautious at corners. The side street was deserted, although there were several cars beside a long row of brass parking meters so old that they still took nickels. A bench at the bus stop was painted with a gaudy advertisement for legal services. It promised to get you what you deserve. Fate scoffed at this and returned to the business at hand, finding out why he had been led to this place. He stepped out into the open and caught sight of a horse-drawn buggy driven by a man with a chin beard and a dark, flat-brimmed hat. Fate recognized the man despite the disguise. What are you up to, Shadrach? muttered Fate to himself. A loud siren startled Fate with a whoop. He turned to see the bright, flashing lights of a police car. It had stopped at the spot where a second ago he had been suspiciously peeking around the corner. Fate knew better than to run, and instead dropped to the ground. He rolled three times. The two officers that had already exited their car found this amusing at first, but soon felt the effects of Fate's untwisted lines. They helped him to his feet and asked if there was anything, anything at all they could do for him. At that same moment, 
a sudden gust of wind over a nearby rooftop carried a tatty $20 bill, bleached by years of sunlight, slowly toward fate. It swayed from side to side, finally drifting past his face. He snatched it from the air and pocketed it without a thought. The officers repeated their request to assist fate. He looked behind them at Shadrach Vogel's buggy as it turned the corner at the far end of the block. No, thanks awfully, though. Just carry on doing whatever you usually do, he said cheerfully with a slight British accent and began jogging after the buggy. He glanced back to see if the officers were giving chase, but they only grinned and waved. When fate turned back to see where he was going, he had stumbled into a crowd of six women exiting a dress shop. They were all wearing identical shiny lime green dresses. The squealing, giggling and pawing began immediately, and it took fate quite a while to make enough room in the scrum to drop to the ground again. He rolled a few times to retwist his lines and struggled back to his feet. That broke the spell, and they disengaged enough for him to get away unpursued. By the time he reached the end of the block where Vogel had turned, there was no sign of him. Fate continued until he reached the alley at the middle of the block. It was a narrow space lined with old blue steel dumpsters and even older wooden utility poles. He could see Vogel at the far end of the alley carrying an unconscious person. Fate was already winded, but ran as fast as he could. It wasn't fast enough, and Vogel was already back on the street by the time Fate reached the open doorway. He could see a young man inside, lying on the floor. Fate hurried over to check on him. Hey! Come on! Wake up! said Fate as he slapped Ryan lightly on the cheek. Ryan's eyes opened slowly, first one and then the other. He looked up at Fate. What time is it? Why do people always ask that? wondered Fate aloud. It's not as if you decided to sleep fully clothed on the floor. You've been stunned. Now come on, wake up. We've got to go. Ryan sat up and struggled to remember why he was on the floor. He studied the strange man who was helping him to his feet. Who are you? Before Fate could answer, Ryan swayed, and Fate helped him onto one of the wooden stools. Now, finally a question worth asking. You can call me Fate, and you are... Ryan Quadros. Why can't I remember anything? How long was I on the floor? Well, it's very nice to meet you, Ryan Quadros. You couldn't have been there long, perhaps only a few minutes. I saw some of what happened. I'm sorry I wasn't faster. There was a problem at a dress shop. Short-term memory loss is a normal symptom of Vogel's touch. It'll wear off. Do you know where you are? Ryan cautiously probed at the bump on the back of his head. Why are you talking so fast? Is that another symptom? What? said Fate, momentarily taken aback. No, I haven't any symptoms. You were the one who got stunned. Do you know where you are? he repeated. Yes, I'm in my shop. You're in northwest South Dakota, said Fate whimsically. Okay, I never heard it described in quite that way before, but yeah, I know where I am, he said firmly. Fate giggled. I just like saying it. Northwest South Dakota. This is probably the eastern part, eastern northwest South Dakota. He giggled again. What was that other word you used? asked Ryan, trying to remember through his pounding headache. Dress shop? guessed Fate, perplexed. That's two words and... No, said Ryan, struggling to recall. It was vogue. Something. You said I was feeling the effects of it. What happened to me? Oh, Vogel's not a thing. He's a man. He must have touched you. Let's see how to explain it in terms you would understand. I'm an engineer, said Ryan dryly. I think if you can pronounce the syllables... I can understand them. Well then, Fate laughed, we are full of ourselves, aren't we? Oh, you also might vomit at some point in the next. He glanced at a wrist that had no watch and pronounced, Forty-five seconds. Ryan turned green, staggered to the corner and emptied his stomach into the trash can. All right, that's out of the way. Now, 
I'm going to speak some syllables. Ryan, who knows everything, prepare to be amazed. First, a rhetorical question. What do you think luck is? Random chance, offered Ryan absent-mindedly as he scanned the room for a bottle of water. Rhetorical, Ryan. You weren't supposed to answer, and you certainly weren't supposed to give an answer that is both wrong and boring. Luck is a moving target. Some days, you get the last donut. Some days, you step in dog droppings. Didn't you ever wonder why some days are lucky and others are? We need a word for the opposite of lucky. Unlucky? said Ryan sarcastically. No, that's just a prefix. It deserves its own word. No matter. I'll tell you what luck is. He paused dramatically. It's the invisible lines. He straightened up and smoothed the front of his shirt as if the lesson was over, but Ryan showed no sign of understanding. The lines. You know, like fishing line, but too small to feel or see, fate repeated. The three invisible strings that control how lucky you are? Ryan blinked slowly and shook his head. You really don't know any of this, do you? What did Vogel want with you? Anyway, the lines or strings or whatever go off in the three different directions. There's one for up-down, another for east-west, and of course north-south. I'm not using too many syllables, am I, Ryan the engineer? Who knows everything? Ryan frowned. And as you move around in the world, they get all twisted up and around you and over you and under you like a straitjacket until you're so hopelessly tangled you'll never get untangled. It gets worse every day of your life. That's why children are so much happier than adults. Oh, and here I thought that was just the crushing weight of responsibility, said Ryan with more sarcasm. It is, said Fate enthusiastically. Exactly. Well, not exactly. Responsibility is what comes from bad luck and bad choices. But what if you could untwist them? Ryan shrugged, finished probing the back of his head, and examined his fingertips for blood. You win the lottery? What? No, of course not. That's too random. Although I really should try that. Never mind. The man who attacked you, well, the man who probably just gently touched your shoulder, he's the opposite of untwisted. Un-untwisted? Ryan mocked. Worse, whispered fate conspiratorially, his lines, he glanced to either side of the room before continuing, have been cut entirely. Now anything he touches breaks. Anyone he touches, fate pointed to Ryan, he broke me? Okay. Well, that's all very fascinating, but I think I need to go home and lie down. So, he gestured to the door. You don't believe me. All right. Fair enough. A demonstration, then. Fate produced an antique brass compass from his pocket. The needle settled down, and he stowed it away again before dropping to the floor with his head pointing northward. He rolled toward the east three times and jumped to his feet. There, that ought to do it, he said. Now, Ryan, what would you say if I, a total stranger, asked you to help me move into my new apartment? Would you consider helping? Absolutely. Let's do it right now said Ryan, feeling more excited than he had since he was a child. Well, now wait, said Fate seriously. Before you agree, you should know. It's on the second floor, and there's no elevator. No problem, I'll bring some beer. And one more thing, Ryan. It's a small thing, but I feel I must mention it. I recently purchased a beautiful slate pool table. It may be a bit heavy, said Fate, with a twinkle in his eye. I'll buy a truck said Ryan eagerly. Let's do it right now. Oh, this is just sad, said Fate flatly. He dropped back to the floor and repeated his role, this time in the opposite direction. What the hell? whispered Ryan as Fate stood. Impressive, isn't it? It's like an instant celebrity fame thing. Real celebrities are immune to its effects, of course. Oh, and small children, too. Nothing impresses them. It makes perfect sense if you think about it. How do people treat a newborn baby? Like a rock star. If that's not celebrity status, I don't know what is. Of course it wears off as they roll around a bit. Now let's go. We need to find where Vogel took your girlfriend. Fate rubbed his hands together 
and headed for the front door. Madison! shouted Ryan, as the effects of Vogel's attack finally wore off. Where is she? I need to call the police. He pulled his phone out, but it refused to respond. Forget about that. Vogel probably got too close to it. The more complicated it is, the easier it is to break. Fate grabbed the phone and tossed it across the room at the trash can in the corner. It bounced off both walls and landed perfectly in the vomit-spattered can. You'll have to get another. And don't worry, I don't think Vogel would kill her, although he may threaten to. The police would just slow things down anyway. I'm not taking that chance. He assaulted me and kidnapped my... my employee. Fate raised one eyebrow at that. Yes, well, let's be sure to discuss the nature of your relationship with your employee later, but for now... He dropped to the ground and rolled again. Ryan, would you like to drive me wherever I want to go? Hell yeah, shouted Ryan with renewed enthusiasm. As they exited the front door of the shop, Fate turned to Ryan and said, Did you know that your workshop smells like new shoes? I know, said Ryan, as if they had discovered something profound. I've tried to get rid of the smell, but it won't go away. Ryan stopped beside his jeep and opened the door for Fate. Is this your car? shouted Fate with excitement. Yes, do you like it? asked Ryan eagerly. I love it. It looks like the top comes off, and the doors too. That's right, said Ryan proudly. He lifted the door off its hinge and tossed it onto the sidewalk, before hurrying around to do likewise with the driver's side door. Fate jumped in, grinning, while Ryan removed the cloth and plastic top. It fell to the ground as Ryan pulled away from the curb with a jerky acceleration. Fate laughed and stood up for a few seconds to feel the wind in his face. Which way? asked Ryan loudly enough for Fate to hear. I'll take you anywhere you want to go. You see, it's all about random chance and probabilities, shouted Fate over the road noise. He tossed the coins in the air and caught one. Keep going straight. They were just passing the dress shop with the confused women in identical green dresses milling about by the front door. When they saw Fate, they screamed and ran after the jeep. Pay no attention to them, Fate assured Ryan. It wears off in about an hour if I'm not around. I'm sorry I was too slow to help your girlfriend. He flipped his coins again, read the message and shouted, Straight again! Ryan accelerated through the intersection as the light turned yellow. I love Madison, he shouted, but she doesn't know it! They were both grinning like madmen, Ryan from the effects of Fate's untwisted lines and Fate from the exhilaration of the wind on his face. After several intersections where the coins had told them to go straight, Fate tossed them again and caught a different one. Turn here, he shouted. Which way? shouted Ryan, still grinning. Left. Ryan slammed on the brakes and turned. He was going so fast that the left side wheels slipped and threatened to leave the pavement. This is rather more fun than I had expected to have today, shouted Fate. 